Hello and welcome to Live Coding Happy Hour for August 30th, 2019, Labor Day weekend, holiday weekend, and we have a big special treat. Hello and uh, welcome to Live Coding Happy Hour for And August I am getting repeating. Hold on one second. So well, how about you guys go ahead and introduce yourself while I find the repeating? Oh, there we are. I found it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Dave Slusher. I'm here with Paul Reynolds, a uh, special guest, and Andrew Barnes. And we are uh, going to do some real world of augmented reality stuff that's kind of a little outside of it's not just so Cody and it's not so service now. -y. We're going to uh, show Paul's stuff. So uh, before we do that, let us get into our longer uh, introductions and we will start with our guest, Paul Reynolds. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Reynolds. Uh, uh, I am co-founder at Torch. Uh, we build a augmented reality uh, creation platform. It's an application development platform, uh, primarily focused on the enterprise. Uh, my background prior to that was working at an augmented reality glasses company called Magic Leap. I was there for a few years uh, overseeing non-gaming applications and software developer uh, tools and ecosystem. And what got me into all of that was a, a, a video game career as a software developer. So I worked in video games for a little over 10 years uh, prior to that. And Andrew? Awesome. Um, I'm Andrew Barnes, developer advocate at ServiceNow. I've been doing ServiceNow stuff for about five years. Been with the, the company itself doing this advocacy role for about a year now. Just, just coming up on my year anniversary sometime, I don't know, I think next week. Uh, and I've been doing enterprise applications and teaching developers for a long time and excited to be here today and, and do something with an external tool, which is neat. All right. And I'm Dave Slusher. Uh, been with ServiceNow six uh, years, been a developer advocate for about four years, uh, been a developer for 20 some years. Uh, and uh, did we mention developer.servicenow.com? If you need to Ding. know more stuff about developer, how to do developer stuff for ServiceNow, that would be the place for this. All right. So a little bit of background. Uh, Paul and I have known each other like 15-ish years, something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, Paul used to live in Myrtle Beach. We used to run a tech conference together with our uh, recently passed friend Andre. And uh, and uh, Paul now is the CEO. Or you're the founder. What what is exactly your title with with Torch? Uh, I am. I, I was CEO. I'm now focused on product. So I'm, okay. I'm chief product officer. Chief product officer. So he's going to show us. I keep wanting to say real world, which is kind of not <laughs> kind of the opposite of what we're talking about. But it's That's funny. It's uh, so it's just different stuff. So Paul, what? Are we, oh, actually, before uh, Paul, we start with we that, need to introduce our beers for the afternoon. All right. Let us let us and, begin and with we you, start Paul. With you, sir. Yeah. So um, I'll go ahead and confess. I stole one of my wife's uh, secret stash beers. Uh, this comes from South Carolina, where I was born and raised. Uh, it's the Westbrook White Tie. It's Ooh, a, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a Belgian kind of wit with a lot of uh, nice little spicy things in it, a lot of coriander. And um, and I, I decided to represent the South on the first one today. Nice. Uh, well, uh, I'm also representing the South. I have got a Tripping Pigs um from the uh, pig pounder brewery here in greensboro so it's a local brew uh it is a uh an american ipa and uh i haven't tried this one before so i'm excited about that and i'm the i'm gonna uh let the team down i've got a new york beer here i bought uh, uh some random beers actually at the greens very close to paul's old house yep. <laughs> and uh i don't even know where this is from this is from hoof hearted brewing and this is like the craziest looking thing it has something oh, yeah. i think it's federer or somebody it, <laughs> this is a american stout with coffee and vanilla Ooh. it's the i don't know what it is blue i don't even know what i'm looking at but <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to drinking it and seeing what the heck it is that's so, anyway. exciting <laughs> yes and it's awesome but something i've got the settings wrong on my beer fridge and it is all my beers are frozen solid, so I'm like thawing it. There, there will probably be some excitement when uh, I open it. It will probably explode. So, all right, with that out of the way, let's. So, Paul, you're going to give us a little bit of background uh, about like what augmented reality is and kind of what Torch is before we get to building a thing. 
Yeah, because uh, it, it is such a new thing, and I, I and in particular, what we find ourselves doing is is a lot of education and just you know it, it, we're in an early market where people are still a lot of people don't even know what it is but the, the interesting part is most of you have probably seen or interacted with augmented reality particularly uh, in the past year um, a lot of you know the face filter type stuff happening on social uh, where people are augmenting their faces that's augmented reality yeah. um, snapchat filters galore yeah, yeah. So that's like a that's the <laughs> that's the most prominent consumer use case. Interestingly, the enterprise, um, you know, what we've observed, you know, I've been in this space for years at this point, and up until 2019, it, it was still a lot of we're trying to figure it out. Is we're not even sure what it is. And and in 2019, we're seeing a a, a very significant uptick. And and my colleagues are, I've spoken to about this agree, where. Finally, the tech is becoming a little bit more approachable and understandable, and, and we're really starting to see um, people finding value in this. So let me let me back it way up, though, because um, what I like to talk about uh, first is just this more general idea of, of what we call spatial computing. And, and all that really means is um, Imagine what you have with a computing device today, which is, you know, you have your processing, your software, your application, um, but that device is also more aware of the physical world that it's in. And so um, that can mean a whole lot of different things. So that could mean, um, you know, that it, it's tracking the person's face, like in the case of Snapchat, it could be a, a camera that knows that people are walking in front of it. But it, it, like this idea of computer vision, artificial intelligence, sensors, giving a computing device some sense of physical awareness. That's the, at the highest level, um, that's, that's what we're talking about. And so, it, it, and then you start to think about, well, once my computing environment is aware of my physical environment and, and me, how can it be more efficient? How can we bring, virtual you know, data and interfaces into the physical world. So, right. so at a real high level, augmented reality is about bringing digital data and interactions into the physical world. And, and that's done by a, a, a computing device of some sort, where whether it's a, a, a camera, a pair of glasses, a smartphone, um, using sensors and other information to kind of figure it out. Um, so what we focus on I worked in the glasses side of things for several years, and then, uh, you know, those things are are still coming along. You know, there's tons of companies working on these uh, wearable type things. Uh, they're expensive. They're they're still kind of developer level devices. Uh, they're slowly getting better, um, but a lot of the capabilities uh, you can actually tap into with smartphones, which are very ubiquitous and have gotten really good uh, about this. And, and so what we like to try to impress upon people is if you start working with augmented reality technology today on traditional devices, that knowledge will transfer into, and actually give you a, a, an advantage in working with the wearable devices, but it eliminates a lot of the cost and you know, the, every, you know, the rapidly changing hardware that's happening on the wearable side. Um, so on a phone, so like to, to kind of make it even more practical, I think everyone's pretty familiar with a phone has um, some sense of it, rotation and acceleration. You know, there's gyroscopes, there's a compass. So generally speaking, before augmented reality, um, for the past several years, your phone knew if it was kind of rotated a certain way and knew if it was mm -hmm. moving a certain speed in a certain direction. But what it didn't know is what that meant relative to the physical world beyond just gravity. So, you know, we are, the, the phone generally knows that gravity is down and it knows where it is related to that, but it doesn't know anything about the physical world. So what, what changed is we started tapping into these cameras and the cameras got uh, uh, better processing. You know, we got faster cameras, better quality, artificial intelligence has significantly boosted the capabilities of these things. And what we're now doing is we're using the sensor data that we already had, and we're now testing it against what the camera sees. And, and then the camera is starting to do things like, oh, that's a floor, that's a wall, that's a tabletop, and I know where I am relative to that. So once you have that point of reference, 
the screen uh, of the device can actually show the video feed and impose, you know, superimpose virtual content on top of that real world video feed. And that's how we marry the digital visuals with the, the physical environment on a phone. And, and to, to probably way oversimplify it, on a pair of augmented reality glasses, those basic uh, ideas are the same, except instead of a video feed, it's the real world feed coming into your eyes and we're, you know, we're placing the virtual content, it's bouncing off of lenses and coming into your eyes. So mm -hmm. that's the only real difference between like smartphone augmented reality today and, and what we'll have in a, a year or two. So yeah, like the difference between what you, like when we were, you referenced the Snapchat filters, right? Mm -hmm. In that case, you have a very constrained uh, thing because you know, you're looking at a face and you know, yep. eyes, nose, you have some known anchor points. And what you're saying is the processing power has increased to the point where you say, I don't even know what I'm looking at, but I will figure it out. Here's edges, here's, you know, things that look like known constructs, doorways and etc. Yeah. So it picks up on, um, features of the environment, recognizable features of the environment. And in the case of face tracking, um, you know, generally speaking, people's faces are laid out about the same. So you can use artificial intelligence to then not only track the position and pose of the face, but also know if they're blinking, if they're smiling, you, you get expressions. And, mm -hmm. you know, like right now, you guys are using these backdrops. I consider that a form of augmented reality. What it's doing is, is segmenting out the detected person in the frame. And, mm -hmm. you know, I assume you guys aren't running green screens or chroma key in the, oh, well, you might be Dave, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, yeah. we both actually are. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do this, you can do this now, uh, today. You, you don't, you no longer need the green screen and the chroma key. Right. You can use artificial intelligence to say, detect all the people and kind of dynamically cut them out of the frame, you know, cut the background out of the frame. Yeah, only for this show do I actually use the green, green screen. <laughs> the rest of the, the rest of the week, the, uh, Zoom is actually good enough to 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 do it with whatever environment I'm in uh, yeah. on Macs, not yeah. on Windows. <laughs> right. It, yeah, it's so actually different. Um, so, um, have you seen? Um, I know just this week, uh, talking about that, you know, awareness. I, I saw. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was Google Maps, where you where you did the the camera to the location. You know, you looked at the intersection with the camera yep. and it it added in arrows pointing you to the to turn the camera until it was like okay now you go down here um so yep. I, I believe i saw that just this week is yeah a, they, they a they've been emerging they, thing they teased it out a few months ago it slowly rolled out it's uh, i actually used it on my iphone they tend to roll out to android first obviously but i used it on my iphone just last week in san francisco the Yes, and, and actually that's a perfect segue because what I, I, I like to help people think about, oh yeah, I actually do use augmented reality and I, I maybe don't even realize it. Um, but a lot of these early use cases are novelty or kind of fun, you know, like where's the practicality? And right. um, that Google example actually is a perfect example of something that augmented reality enables that's very difficult to do any other way, which is what we call wayfinding. And so, you know, the idea of you no longer have to mentally map this 2D overhead view of where I'm trying to get to, to what I see in the world, you hold up your phone. And uh, the way that one works is uh, they're using their Google Street View and, right. and their map data. And they actually have you look around enough to look at buildings nearby. And that's their, that's their point. That, those are its key points because yep. it, it knows about them and it's already mapped them. And it's like, oh, okay. It's kind of like the, uh, uh, you know, getting your star chart like yeah. oh yeah i know these these points and now you've hit them and so now i know where you are relatively uh and, yeah, and, and for me that, yeah go ahead when i come out of a subway <laughs> and i know which road i need to be on but i can't i don't know which direction i need to go on the road and like or there's no sign for the road like that's my that's the key time where i'm like because once i'm already going down the instructions that's you're fine then you know all the relativity because you've progressed, but that first point of I've emerged from the subway now, which way do I, which way do I go? That, right. That's where that's going to be key for me. Uh, improvement and like easy improvement in life. Cause we travel a lot and we go to places we've never been before. And it's like, all right, 
the first step is the hardest one, which, you know, you walk, you're walking down the street and you, you watch your, uh, you know, your little dot and you're like, Oh, that didn't go the right way. All right. Turn around and do the other one then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah. So that moment where the, where the device and the software, uh, feels confident and knows where you're, where you are is called localization. So once you get localized, um, it can start to put stuff in the world and say, Hey, look this way. Um, and, and actually in the Google uh, na AR navigation example, um, they actually encourage you to only occasionally, because they don't want you walking around just looking at your phone or yeah. crossing the street. And, and, and what's interesting is actually, if you do cross the street with that active, the screen goes dark and it says, please look Please forward. pay attention <laughs> to what you're doing. <laughs> look like at the you. world. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but you know, it, it is Put me everybody, down. Stop looking everybody <laughs> everyone can relate to the, I'm in a new physical environment and I, I don't, I don't have my bearings yet, or I don't, I'm mm -hmm. trying, like it, it, it could be a hospital, it could be a public safety, you know, we'll talk about a data center, like you, you once, you know, everybody can relate to, I need help getting somewhere. I have this really smart pocket computer. Why can't it just show me where to go? Uh, and, and so we find a lot, we find a lot of use cases, valuable use cases around uh, wayfinding adding a layer of digital information as a part of that process. So the, the other part of it is, is yeah, Google's uh, example will get you, it, it uses the, there's also a, a distinction between turn by turn and wayfinding and they, they're kind of using it for turn by turn to help augment that experience. But the other piece of that is they can now bring in points of interest and like, you know, some more experimental stuff, not necessarily associated with Google, but like I'm walking down the street and maybe I want to see what the street looked like a hundred years ago. Like I went in you know, and they can superimpose yeah, another layer and let you yeah. do the swipey thing. And, and yeah, that's, that sounds uh, really neat. The, the game changer for me in, in uh, like a wearables way is when it can, when it can put somebody's name floating over their head <laughs> and, and my quick notes about them, that will, that will completely change my life. Cause I can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that one comes up a lot the, that one's like the uh the, the usual one is can i can you bring up their linkedin profile by their face it has some uh it has some privacy implications there you know are we doing facial recognition are we but but these are all things we need to be aware of and i even just mean on my data like yeah. i will collect the data store it of these people and in the, in the information i just i need to use it as my own memory bank yeah, it is a tool of our trade that we do not say nice to meet you. <laughs> we've met them before. We always just say good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Which is <laughs> so My anyway, uh, with all that said, so that's actually a good segue into let's now let's start to see the point where uh, so these sources of information, right? We're talking about Google Map and kind of the self-contained stuff, but the whole reason that we're here is that now we're looking to wire together Torch yep. with ServiceNow. Yep. So you want to start by kind of showing the, t just the torch thing and kind yeah. of share your screen. Yeah. And I can, I, I probably, um, uh, are, are my, I'm going to turn my video off to give you more real estate. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, I, I should probably talk more about what torch is since that's why we're here. Yeah. Um, so, so what we found, you know, so I, like I said in the intro, my, my background was in video game software development, which kind of predisposed me to building interactive 3d content. And, um, a lot of these technologies, we didn't even get into VR, but, VR and AR are pushing the envelope of interactive 3D software, not as a gaming necessarily technology. And what we're finding is, and what I found very early on, um, was companies that are interested, they see the value in this, and we're gonna do a, a practical example here, but they wanna get started. And, and a few years ago before Torch, kind of the inroads into how do you build software for this 3D stuff? Like I'm a very, I have a very talented, you know, application team that can build a mobile app and a web app all day long. How can they get started in 3D and, and augmented reality? And, and unfortunately the answer has always been, well, you got to learn to use video game tools. And, um, you know, it's a totally different type of development workflow. Not only that, 3D models and data, way more complicated and convoluted than dealing with 2D images and, and 2D assets like a lot of people are familiar with. So that was ultimately the opportunity we saw was we could build a completely new 
creation workflow for enterprise and let your existing team work with augmented reality directly to see how it might apply to your business or problem without getting bogged down in all these new skills that are you know, not related to your core business. And so we just want to give people a, a, a really easy way to, if, if not just tinker without augmented reality, actually implement augmented reality in a practical way. So we designed a creation workflow and that's what I'll show. So I'm gonna, let's see. So um, uh, yeah. no, you want to get set up, yeah. um, what I've pulled up, so I've, uh, I've got a ServiceNow instance here. Um, I've got our uh, business service mapping view pulled up, which is the relationships from objects in our CMDB. Uh, this represents my house's uh, Philips Hue light setup. So I've got my uh, controller and all of the lights have dependencies to that. Uh, we've got uh, groupings to rooms. And uh, so we're gonna use these as, uh, so I've set up some rest endpoints that we're gonna use in our interaction uh, to trigger some of these lights. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through more of it later, but I, I wanted to show, uh, this is the, the relationship between these things and this is uh, what we've got on the ServiceNow side. And now we're gonna uh, look at how we can uh, use uh, Pulse tools uh, to interact with uh, data and and uh, and do things with that information, and I'll stop sharing and let you share now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're uh, we decided to go uh, all in and do some IoT as well <laughs> in this process. So let's see. Where's go big or go home. Go, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna bring up. I'm on an iPad, and it might take a couple seconds for that to come up. I'll let you guys tell me when it appears. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to also kind of walk through, uh, the, the interface. So, it's up. um, okay. Thank you. The, so the, the, the torch primary creation workflow is on a mobile device. So I'm on an iPad. We work on iPhone. Um, the Android side of the creation tool isn't available yet. Um, but the reason why we thought that was important was because if you're building interfaces that are in the physical world, you should be able to move around in the physical world. And in fact, when we get into the second demo, I'm gonna switch off my wired headphones because I'll have to walk around the room a little bit more. But I've got a project here, I just called it Andrew Light. And um, actually I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna call back to what we um, were talking about earlier. I'm gonna try to move slowly because I think the frame rate over screen share is not, not super smooth, but you'll see how it's kind of picking up the floor. Uh, it's putting these dots, it might be hard to see on our carpet, but uh, mm -hmm. as I move around, it's picking up the floor and it's painting these dots. And that's showing me that it's, that, that's that spatial awareness. It's, it's detected a flat plane. Um, I'll actually try to get over. And so little. that, that would also be like a table or yeah. Thing. Yeah. So I was going to try to get over it. So now it's picked up this one. So now we've got the floor and the tabletop. Are those dots, are there, so those dots are a, a fixed, uh, fixed distance from each other in the real world. So that like, if you tilting, it's like, uh, is it correcting for perspective from that? Yeah, yeah. So you can see it's actually mapping to the table and the floor. Like if I get down closer to the floor, it's gonna, you know, scale properly. Um, this cursor that you're seeing is what we call the world anchor, and and that's kind of the the origin point of any project. And uh, and, and for the purposes of this, uh, I'm just gonna tap uh, just right here on the floor. And you'll see that world anchor becomes kind of stuck there. So it is there on the floor. And this is, that. yeah, we're and this is, now. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're anchored. And, and this is uh, my blank space. This is an empty project. And, and so one of the, the first things we ran into when we re researched why, why is that so hard for people to get into working with 3D, it's getting your assets into uh, the appropriate format. So we, we try to make that super easy. So I just tapped that lower right add button, which we call this our asset drawer. And you can see I can pull in from all kinds of different sources. So I'm gonna do two. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna first show uh, 3D models. So we connect to these third party services. One's called Sketchfab uh, uh, and one call, one's called Poly. Poly's from Google. And if I just search for robot, it's going to hit their repository of 3D models that are free to use. 
Um, and then the way this works is I kind of get this listing here and I can scroll through and see what I like. And if I want to put this into the world, we literally do a drag and drop. So I'm going to grab this guy here. And as I move him, he's going to become a cube. And he is now uh, being transferred into the environment. Uh, I can use, so you, I've, we've got our tab, my taps are visualized here. So you can see my finger taps are, I can use a single finger to move them around the room. Uh, I can twist to rotate around. Uh, I can use two fingers to move them up. So now this is about head height where I'm seated and it's selected. Um, so I can move complete. This is the other thing a lot of people don't understand is I can move completely around this thing in my room. And so that's a cool way to get some quick 3D stuff in. Probably more uh, practical is I was going to pull in some 2D stuff from our Dropbox here. That's really cool. Um, so is the is the way to get started like how do you get started like i i know we're doing this the, and you've already got some uh, a little bit prepared but like, like how do i take the first step yeah well so the app is free to download it's just torch ar on the app store it's free to use the only thing we charge for is maybe you're just using this to build a prototype or test an idea if you wanted to deploy this out into some other production content you want to embed it in your mobile app there's a technology called Web AR, or you want to publish this out. We charge a license fee for the ability to export out, but you can also just there's unlimited projects. Um, you you can just get yeah. And, and as far as assets go, you know, um, I'll bring up this drawer again. Um, there's also your camera roll. You don't need. Uh, you could actually just take pictures. You could you could scratch out some ideas on a notebook take pictures with your iPhone or iPad and immediately pull them in. Pull them in. That's yeah, cool. like. Like this is just a graphic I made in Photoshop. That's a it's a two D. You can see how it comes in as a flat plane. Yeah. And you can you can size it, move it around however you like. We want to say hello to the folks at Dragon Con, and uh, have a great time there. Yeah. In Atlanta. I know a few folks there this weekend. All right. So we got our cool robot and resolved floating yeah. around. <laughs> yeah yeah so, yeah yeah and so like i i, I like to just yeah do you guys have any other, like th this is the general interface uh we're we're in what we call the up at the top you can see that we're in the main scene scenes are kind of a and a, a construct of uh, of a workspace that you can mm -hmm. uh, switch scenes i um, i know how i'm going to uh creatively uh utilize some time this weekend <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> right. and, uh, yeah okay uh, and, so all right, so now let's start talking about uh, how this view now begins to interact with the other world. And this is where we're going to get kind of into the coding part of it. And yep, yep. now part of it. Yep, so, so Torch is a, uh, an authoring environment, but not a coding environment. And um, I'll explain what that means. So we can connect interactions. So I'm going to select this one object, the Resolved button. And there's this lightning bolt here in the, the right corner. That's our interactions. And I'm going to add an interaction. And uh, interactions are fired off of triggers. And so these triggers are, um, you know, select is obviously the viewer has tapped on it. Gaze means someone has looked at it, which means it's, it's actually, in the, in the case of a headset, it means they've, they've literally looked at it. Yeah, in they the case focused of a, in on it, uh, yeah. looked at it. Yeah, and in, in the case of a mobile device, it means the camera is pointing at it. And then um, proximity is a really cool one. That means we actually know how close you are to a given object because of the spatial awareness. So we can actually automatically respond if you get within a, within a certain distance. So to keep it simple, we're going to just say on select. Um, and so you can say, well, I only want that to fire once, or I want it to fire infinitely. We'll say infinitely because we're, we're going to do a toggle thing here. Um, and then in your responses, uh, we can actually do a couple things. Um, one is we can have um, another object like respond. So we could have this guy move up a little bit. And so he's now appeared in my response list and he's just gonna, every time we tap it, he's gonna move up a little bit. But the thing we were gonna connect to, to the, the thing Andrew set up is an API call. And so I can just, these are my other options. So these are the other things you can do that don't affect something in the scene. And in my API call, uh, I can just paste in a URL. I think I got the right thing. I'm gonna be hitting the, the candle 
uh, webhook that, that Andrew gave me. And, and that's it. It's hooked up. And we auto save everything. Everything's stored on the cloud continuously. Um, so that's, that's it. So what we want to do is test it. Are, are you ready to test your light? I'm ready. Night? All right. All right. So just before we before you do that, Andrew, tell yeah. a little bit about the background of what you set up for to make this. Absolutely. Ending. So um, from our side, um, I've I've got uh, these lights, these Philip Hue lights. Um, they have a uh, controller, um, a, a Hue Hub, I think is what they call it, uh, and they've got an API. And so today, I did all this today because uh, you know it's not live coding if we're not. Uh, <laughs> If we're not risking things, right? <laughs> <laughs> so today I went and learned how to uh, interact with the uh, the Hue APIs, um, and I set up a, a mid server um, in my local network, uh, which is just a, a way to to get through onto my local network. Um, and I set up a, a, some uh, API calls from a ServiceNow instance to interact with the Hue bridge. Uh, and get data about uh, all of the lights that my bridge knows about. So I've got about 16 of them. Uh, so I created a light table um, and that's what I rendered on the, that relationship map was all of the lights I've got and then their relationship to the bridge and their relationship to rooms. Uh, so I set all of that up. And then, so that was my ServiceNow instance interacting with Hue. Um, the Hue bridge that I've got in my house. Um, and then what I uh, added uh, just, you know, mo moments ago almost <laughs> was, was an endpoint for someone else to tell my ServiceNow instance to do something with one of my lights. So uh, my ServiceNow instance, when you hit a particular endpoint right now, will toggle the state of that light. Um, so it will turn, if it's on, it will turn it off. If it's off, it will turn it on and back and forth. Yeah, so and that's uh, the setup I've prepared. I put a little, I, we, at Torch, we, are, we have no problem with completely shameless branding. So we stuck the ServiceNow logo in the project for you as well. Nice. Uh, and Dave, you're gonna want to uh, pull in my- uh, Yeah, I'm trying to move your picture. Well, this should catch up on the uh, OBS here in a second. Oh, is it not? Hmm. This is uh, entirely Zoom on the thing is we're not seeing you. Uh, so go, we'll. So if you go to the first, um, the, the our regular video view, it should have the screen share on there as well. All right, so. Well, there's definitely all of me. All right, I'm not sure how to get both on the screen at the same time. Let's see if we can figure this out. Um, let me swap it back. So, uh, ba -bum -bum. let's not worry. This is probably in, uh, an OBS level thing because I think OBS does not have both windows in there. Okay. Well, um, I, I, I will, I will audibly tell you uh, <laughs> if the light uh, comes on and off. We were gonna, we were gonna show the light on and off, but. Uh, uh, I will let you know, and you can you can trust me because I will tell you when we fail. I can swap back and forth. Uh, if you guys talk, I can try really quickly to uh, uh, OBS this, but well, I, I can uh, yeah actually. So what I could do is let's go ahead and make this interact. We made that interaction so easy. Let's maybe make it a little harder. I'm gonna actually grab the unresolved uh, button and pull that in, and. Let's see, I'll put it. So here's another thing when you're working in 3D. So I'm only sitting in this one spot. So we tell people this all the time, move around because from one angle, this looks like unresolved is huge and sort of behind the resolve button, the service now logo. I'm not quite sure where it is. As soon as you move, you start oh, to realize yeah. where wow. the stuff That's is. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So you gotta move around. That's the biggest mistake I see people make is they sit in one spot and they get it all perfect. And then they realize it's, so like a lot of things, what I'll do, you'll watch me, um, I'll actually pull stuff until it covers it up. So I kind of know, okay, that's about, that's about where that is. Uh, so if I pull it through, okay, I know I'm getting closer. Um, you know, there's also more precise ways to match these sizes, but. 
So what we can do is I've got this unresolved and resolved, and I'm going to make unresolved invisible. And so that gets grayed out, but it's still there so we can select it. And then for resolved, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in that interaction that I hooked up. And I'm actually going to say, actually, when we tap this, I want the resolved button to go invisible. And I want the unresolved button, make sure I just select the unresolved button. I want that to become visible. So now it's giving me kind of a preview a of toggle. what yeah. it's going to look like. So what that's going to do is it's going to call your API. It's also going to uh, hide uh, the, the, the resolve, and it's going to show the unresolved, and the robot's going to move up. And then what I can do is I can now hook up the unresolved, and I'm going to do an API call. And I'm just going to, since you've got your webhook set up, as I'm just going to call the same webhook. OK. And so, and what I'm going to do there, so it's going to call the same webhook, and I'm going to do kind of the opposite. I'm going to make, um, when this thing gets selected, I'm going to make it invisible. And when resolve, uh, I'm going to, you know, by this time, resolve will have been invisible. So I'm going to make it visible. So that's kind of the, so, so now we'll get like a toggle. We'll get two different buttons appear uh, as, as we do it. But I'm afraid to test it because I don't know how close Dave is. To... <laughs> no, so uh, we we've got Andrew on the screen, so we should we will be able to see okay. in a small thumbnail if uh, his light comes on. <laughs> okay. Hold it really close to your face. So, so, um, so, <laughs> so this is the editing environment. We want to test this. We want to test all the interactions. So I'm going to hit the play button, and when I hit play, you can see all the UI goes away. We're now in the interactive mode. The invisible thing is actually invisible. And this is our button, and I'm going to tap it, and you can see the, oh, the little guy moved up, like we yep. told him to. Yep, and uh, I don't know how long it takes for the webhook to call in, but we it, can keep we can keep hitting it. It should it should be relatively quickly. So if it doesn't come off soon, then I'm gonna, you know, this is live. This is live. This We're live this. coding here. This, this <laughs> so, is not a polished demo. The next, <laughs> the next step, if it doesn't actually do it, then I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll share uh, Andrew's screen. Yeah, we'll share my screen and go yeah, through we'll my debug steps. It. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll hit it one more time. And you'll, so what's interesting is we're doing the visibility toggle thing, but I'm not controlling the robot with this button. So in that case, I've hit the webhook again but nothing's really changed except the visibility. And then I'll hit it one more time just for fun because the robot moves up. And <laughs> just for fun. Yeah, it'll moving. keep moving up. So yeah, so it looks like we got a problem on your right. end. It works on my machine. Hey, I like it. The problem <laughs> on my end is a thing I can solve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As, so we, as Andrew, uh, Andrew takes over the screen share, um, like in the chat, people have noticed, um, uh, for example, that your robot is casting a shadow. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a part of that spatial awareness. So whenever we detect a flat plane, we go ahead and make that a shadow catching. Uh, that's the cool part of it. That's, that's what makes this content feel like it's in the environment, is that it properly interacts with the environment. Other things we can do, we're not doing it here, but we can actually adjust the lighting of the content to match the lighting of the room. So if, like, if somebody came in and flipped on the overhead light, the content would properly brighten up just like everything else in the room would. Um, so it, it, again, it just goes back to these devices being more and more aware of the physical environment they're in and, and using that to, to, to enhance the content. Um, I'm going to ask you a silly question. Which endpoint did you hit? Did you hit floor white or uh, candle. candle? Yeah. Okay. And I used the URL Dave gave me, so he might be the... I could always be the weak uh, point. <laughs> Let me see if, all right, so there is, do, 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 do. So uh, this is uh, the mid servers queue, the ECC queue. Um, and here is, uh, I just hit this endpoint from uh, Postman. Um, and I think maybe I had something wrong in my endpoint. So let's take a look real quick at the uh, REST API. And this will be new for Paul. So you've never. So this this account. will be new for Paul. Um, so we've uh, we have the ability. So all of our tables uh, out of the box have regular, um, 
you know, CRUD operations uh, for the table APIs generated automatically. Yep. Um, but we have the ability to create scripted um, REST APIs uh, against these things as well. Um, and that is what I did for yours so that I can control what the inputs and what my expected output um, are as well. And come on, where is my endpoint? I created it today. There it is, Q. Um, and so we've just got the lights on. It's a simple post. It should be very straightforward. Get the light ID and let's check our log to see if we wrote to the logs. All right. Oh, we got some errors here. That I love errors. That's Look at right. that. Something to work with. Uh, so light ID is candle, so I'm probably failed on looking up candle. Maybe the light is not actually called candle. <laughs> that will be that will be case, funny. Is it case it, sensitive? I wonder if it is case sensitive. Most things in ServiceNow are not, but oh, speak so. of the devil. Uh, Dave, Craig, Craig Stepp sent me a little message that he saw. <laughs> from... Oh yeah, he's down in Dragon Con. Yeah, with, uh, with our buddy of the show, uh, Chuck Tomasi. Uh, so Candle does exist. Um, let me try one more thing. So I log in light as Candle. I saw an ECCQ item for it. Um, this is the new one I just did. What are we getting here? Success. So when you hit it with API Explorer, it toggles your oh, lights. Maybe I, maybe I only did on. It is entirely possible that that's what I did. <laughs> uh, that is what I did. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't do toggle. I did, uh, <laughs> I did turn it on. So um, I, I could change that real quick. <laughs> All right. uh, so I told it light on and oh, instead, yeah. um, I needed to tell it to toggle uh, so yeah I will fix that really okay quickly. so you can you can uh, pull up the, your screen share again because that'll take a second and it won't take me long to fix this at all okay I just need to remember the function name um, and my script include so actually, uh, we've got an interesting uh, mix of uh, Torch people and ServiceNow people, which is kind of actually uh, interesting. So someone is seeing, everyone is seeing something new. Uh, which one way or the which other. is fun, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so now my API uh, actually uh, does what I want it to do, which is toggle the lights state. And I will test it. So you're hitting it with the uh, REST Explorer? I am. And, and we are looking at, we can see your screen in the th thumbnail. I am. And uh, Andrew, the question is, where is the hue class defined? Did you write a script include? Yes, I wrote a script include uh, to uh, be able to call from anywhere in my system to to do these actions. I stole heavily from uh, uh, Jason McKee and Chuck Tomasi, uh, who have previously done these Hue integrations. Um, so I absolutely uh, heavily heavily had fun stealing things from them. <clears throat> and that is. Let me undo that really quick. Why did I fail? Do stick true. While you're at it, Paul, uh, while yeah. he does that, can you add a, in the unresolved, can you add a downward action? Oh, for the robot, yeah. Yeah, so that the robot goes up 
when you resolve it and down when you <laughs> yeah, unresolve I've, I've already added to, some, <laughs> let's, let's see. eventually I'm hitting the ceiling. Yeah, well, uh, it, we're going if here. you didn't have that, would it eventually be like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? It would just go through the ceiling and up and out. Yeah, you can also limit it. Like, uh, so the position change um, is cumulative right now. Uh, we could say absolute. So if if we say absolute, what that means is, if, like, if I put it basically on the ground, mm -hmm. then it'll only it'll move to that absolute position. If it's cumulative, it means it would add these values every time. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is we can actually change resolves as well. I'll go into that interaction. And for the robot, we'll make the position change absolute. So now he won't just fly through the ceiling. He'll either travel up this high or down that low, uh, depending upon which button it hits. Cool. And out of, here's a question. Is, is, it, is Torch intuiting where the light source is, or is it... Uh, is it just taking a guess, or is it actually figuring it out from other shadows? And... We're, yeah, we're not. We're, we're not. It, it can, we can do that. It, that. That technology does exist to like look at the real world lighting and estimate uh, brightness, color, and shadow. Um, we already struggle with like cramming all this stuff into a mobile device and not kill, <laughs> killing your battery. So um, we we pick our battles. So. <laughs> In, the, in that case, so in this case, like that shadow is, um, if I were in a totally different room, that shadow would be the same intensity and right. would be on different okay. surfaces. Um, you know, I could kind of show. Can you give me a click of the result? Oh, yeah. Let's... All right. Okay. Drum so roll. Which, oh, look at that. We can see. So that's resolved and then unresolved. No light. Resolved. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes the webhook takes a minute. Um, I don't know how. I don't know what the latency is on it, but yeah, we're dealing with you know your system contacting mine, and then mine uh, doing a, a, a so the mid server in ServiceNow uh, land actually checks at the checks from my local network to ServiceNow to see if it's got anything. And so there is a little delay, but I don't think we're actually. So let me. Uh, I'm not. I'm not seeing yours cause update. Uh, and so, Paul, one of the questions is about the verb that we're using. Um, the Torch API sends a get, and you're responding to get, correct, Andrew? I I was responding to a put, but uh, so yeah. Yeah, we might not be doing put. I can uh, switch it to a get. It is literally yeah. a two second change yeah. to change the verb on that. Sure. Yeah, I, that's a that's a good call. I'm now so, responding to a get. Yeah. Give that a whirl. Give that a whirl. Okay, we're back in play mode. Hit resolved. Ha ha! Whoa! Look at that. <laughs> Unresolved. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Adam Michelle in the uh, uh, chat. Oh, that's Adam Michael. That's uh, Adam he's Michael? on our team. <laughs> okay. There we go. On and oh. off. He's a Surfside, uh, South Carolina boy, Dave. Awesome. Nice. Right. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah. You yeah, have to, we, we you have to accept the, the, you know, from my end, I have to accept your request. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I didn't even think of, uh, you know, we, we kept it kind of simple. You know, we, uh, you know, one thing we love is feedback and, uh, like, hearing uh the the you know just like you guys do like the the customer requests and needs and so you know we've thought way ahead like for example when we do api call right now uh you know we just put in a, a url um we do document what we how we post you know the how we send the request but you know we've got all kinds of ideas about how you could send parameterized data send a json packet get a response back, pull that back in. But before we build any of that actually out, we wanna see how people are using it. Um, so we've, we've kind of kept it simple on the API call for now, but it, it's something, or if you're getting that complex, um, that's where you get into like our SDK, where you say, well, for the purposes of testing this out, this works, uh, we're gonna want in the production version, we're gonna wanna be able to connected even more. We're going to want to do a proper put. We're going to want to pass user ID and things like that. Um, in that case, what you would do is you would take this project we've built and we have a web dashboard 
that lets you export out a, a binary. And that binary can be loaded in, in a production coding environment, depending upon what SDK you're using. And then that's where you can further integrate this stuff. But for the purposes of quick testing, you know, just hitting the uh, a get uh, API call or a, yeah, it's fine. So um, we talked about uh, the ability to, to, you know, go through a scenario um, Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, someone who's utilizing ServiceNow might actually go through. Uh, and since I wasn't set up to do that, uh, we won't be using my lights, but we're going to simulate a sort of similar experience, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, this one requires me to, so this is my data center that we're looking at here. It's a um, lovely, yeah. lovely data center you have there. I have to walk around my business. Uh, I believe we're doing a transition here. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to switch to wireless. There we go. Can you guys hear me okay? We can yeah. hear you again, sir. Yes. Great, great. So now I'm now I'm mobile. So I can I can walk around a little bit more. By the way, while I've got this project still up, here's kind of like, you know, just you know, we made this little 2D UI super fast. And there's interesting things like, well, wait a minute, I can actually walk behind stuff. And uh, you know, just getting people to think about software interfaces in 3D, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways we can address that. Um, we can always have the UI face the viewer and stuff, but it's just little things like that that people don't think about, or the fact that I can actually walk through yeah, through through, know, the, through stuff <laughs> and and read the words backwards, and uh, and that yeah. might not be the greatest experience. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we got like a, th- this is a little bit of a. Um, this is a little bit of a cooking show moment where we've already got the turkey in the oven here. Um, so I've got another project set up uh, and, and it's completely based on everything we've shown live is, is this idea of hanging elements in the space and hooking up interactions. Um, now, at like any good cooking show, let, let's <laughs> tell the audience how long it took you to cook this in the oven. That's fair, that's fair. It took me, um, to actually put it all together, it took me about, uh, an hour, uh, and that was because I was tinkering, tinkering around with a bunch of different ideas. That the final thing we're showing probably took me about forty-five minutes to thirty minutes to to get like fully done and tested. Okay. Um, so I'm actually I forgot I got another little element. So I'm gonna start from the actually, camera, right? Yeah, I'm gonna start in the camera because so here's the premise. Uh, I'm in my huge data center, and um, I've been. I've gotten some sort of notification from ServiceNow. ServiceNow sent them a push notification in our app that right. an incident with our Hue bridge. And right. They need to go fix that because so I'm the, lights aren't working. I'm the I'm the I'm the tech that's gonna the, figure out the issue, and so I already know that it's happening in the data center. So um, what I'm gonna do is I've got a little marker here. Again, the, the branding is completely shameless in this entire uh, thing. <laughs> and, so, and, and we love the shameless branding. <laughs> so any smartphone today, uh, finally iOS caught up to the rest of the world can recognize a QR code. So we've got a QR code here and you can see it's offering to open this application in Torch. Um, so I'm gonna tap that and that's gonna send me into Torch, which is gonna look like where we've been for you know the the last hour, but the difference is is the app is going to immediately open not in editing mode, but in um, in play mode. I'm in a viewer. This is the end user actual yes. interactive mode. Yeah, so I, I've got I've got my service now push notification. I say okay, I'm headed to the data center. I scan the QR code to validate I'm physically in the space, and now it's brought up this camera on my my mobile device. And then I go back to that QR code and we actually recognize that image in Torch. We do image tracking. And so I've got this incident alert and it's, you know, it's detected some anomalies. It's telling me which device is detected and it's telling me I need to go to a physical location in the data center. Uh, this particular company, um, very strange company, they, they coded their data center sectors uh, using this strange uh, language. <laughs> but I'm, I'm I'm attaching this this alert to this QR code, so I know the person's physically standing here. So this is that moment of spatial awareness and calibration we talked about. So I need to help this person. You know, this is, goes back to the Google navigation conversation. I need to help this person. I need to help myself 
get to uh, the proper rack in this huge data center. So I'm gonna tap this, uh, and this is just using the interaction system where I'm gonna tap it, and here we go, I've got some arrows. And they're showing me where to go. I don't know, could it be in this closet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but okay we've got a marker here we've got another marker and oh so so what we did is we we image tracked that and so we recognized okay now we've validated that i'm standing here and i actually went ahead and threw a 3d server rack in here to, <laughs> to be a weirdo just um, to be a, just to be clear both that sign and the rack are not really there that's correct that is correct i'm because uh, that sign it actually looked like you had a, a sign hanging on your wall up the right like well, right before that popped up so that is real. So, so, um, and actually oh, okay. what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump out of here. Uh, I'm going to go oh, okay. into, I'm going to go into the, um, the actual project because we're going to hook up those same, uh, those same things we'd hooked up before, uh, in the test project. So yeah, this is a real piece of paper. Oh, that is a pe piece of paper. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, this is where I it gets fun you is you were like I, convinced I can't it was a, yeah. so real that it looked like it was rendering. And right, you, it, it you cast a little shadow around the edge. I'm like, man, that is uh, really realistic. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, so you can see up at the top, I'm in the main scene, which is actually down here. You can kind of see some of our behind the scenes. This is that QR code uh, mm -hmm. reference that we're tracking. This I'm trying to move slower because I know the frame rate's not great. Oh, nice. This is a, oh, yeah, this is a you know, this is a real world thing. But yeah, you see how my hand isn't obscuring it. So that's how you kind of know that that's the fake content. Um, but that's, that's, so we'll go back over here and you can see up here, I've got main scene. I'm actually going to switch into sector scene and sector scene is the one that's looking for this particular image. And you can see, so now I'm going to put my hand up. You can see it's actually superimposing the reference image over the physical image. So you got to kind of remember that that's, both real and fake at the same time. And here is our buttons. And it's gonna move a little wonky right now because I'm I'm walking around. So if I go in here, add an interaction, this is the resolve button. You can see the little thumbnail there in the lower left. And I'm gonna say, make the API call. I think I've still got it in the clipboard. Do I not? No. Oh no. Okay. Let me switch over to my notepad here. Our so, super secret notepad. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's see, I've got that. Let me paste that in. So that's the API call. I'm gonna hit on the um, resolve buttons that's hooked up. And we could go ahead, since we're doing the toggle thing, uh, I can hook that up to this one as well. API call. And we're not doing any of the um, crazy like uh, hiding right. stuff or anything that we're doing. Right. If we, had a, if we had an off and an on, either a parameter or something, you could call that on each one, right? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, in our case, we just have the single endpoint, but you could easily have multiple endpoints or parameterized in endpoints my end or whatever. My endpoint accepts a parameter. Uh, I yep. just give it to you to, to keep it simple. Yeah, we could pass it. Yeah, we could use the same endpoint and just keep passing. You could actually leverage that one endpoint and pass multiple parameters. And you know, you could you could target different, in this case, lights and target the different state, change the color, pass in a different color, uh, that type of thing. So I don't know if that's toggling your light, Andrew. It did. <laughs> it just toggled it. Uh, <laughs> I just realized we've live broadcast the URL to the lights in your house. It's, it's all right. <laughs> that That is perfectly okay. What, I, what is more surprising is that no one else has toggled them. Yeah. <laughs> Someone is uh, quickly uh, trying to type, in, type that in. To, uh... <laughs> yeah, that is so the I... surprising part. So yeah, we're, we're, we're okay with uh, our friends uh, pressing my light buttons for a couple more minutes. <laughs> All right, super so yeah, cool. Yeah, so that's kind of the, you know, here's a little practical example, wayfinding. Uh, we're using image tracking to verify that you're in an All right. actual and location. Your, your screen has just gone dark, I think, from... Uh... Uh -oh. oh, all of a sudden I have to, uh, let's see, trust a... the computer. Let me... And that's all right, I think we're... Yeah, I think, we, I was we can have, I think we're done with that. Yeah. yeah. All right.
Super awesome. I'll tell you what, I think let's uh, let's go out on a high point. We learned this the hard way last week. <laughs> <laughs> when I had a, I had a success and I came very very close to trying a new thing, I'm like, no 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 no, take the win, take the win. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're not you know we do live coding on here uh we 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 did a little cooking on this one at, just for the example at the end because i didn't have the the app set up here or we could have done it here um but that's that's super cool like it was really interesting and but yeah we we uh we more often than not end up uh, not completing all of our objectives on the show. So <laughs> having checked all of our jo our boxes for today, uh, well, we're going to call that a victory. <laughs> so like some of the, so Paul too, um, so the, the events that the, that, that will call the webhook, they don't, do they, they don't have to be, um, do they, are they only interactions of a user or, so for example, I'm trying to think of a use case where we might want to change a color. Like we could say there's an incident that has was created by all this stuff and you could close the incident out. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say the incident, like there's a business rule that changes the priority of it. Like mm -hmm. if you breach SLA, it goes from say, yeah, say it moves the priority up or something, or moves the criticality up or something like that. We could, for example, like your light could get more red based on the, uh, severity of the most critical incident you have in your queue or something like that. Yeah. And I can Does, control that from my side, but what, what would, was... would torch send that to you? Would torch do things like that? Or is it only a human interacting with the environment that so, would trigger um, a torch end? I'm going to frame it just a slightly different way. What, what ways can data feed into your yes. interactions other than the, than the spatial data that a phone is giving? What other, yeah. You know, can my app, when I'm integrating with your APIs and your SDK and I've brought that in, what hooks can I hook into to feed data in? Yeah, so that's when we get in. So think of, uh, that's definitely the direction we want to head is, um, is allowing you to connect more stuff in the visual design environment. Um, it's tricky because we're doing it all on a mobile screen and we've got to build all the UI for it. And at some point, you know, debugging tools and things like that become more important. So I think the best way to think about it in the near term is that the, the, the design environment where we built together those things as an interface builder, and it can do some calling out. But if you want to do dynamic data in, and, and like I, I showed the dialogue that showed the, the kind of... Um, the history diagram mm -hmm. that the, the event manager showed. Uh, right. Like, let's say we wanted that to be a live feed on, on the dialogue. That's where our, the publish and SDK product comes in. So what okay. I would do, I would hook up the dialogue in the design environment um, with all the known interactions. And then I would export that project out as a runtime module. And then the SDK would let me pull that in and um, we have it, the SDK provides APIs, so the SDK can say, um, "I want to fire this event. I want to. I want to know when this event is fired on the torch side." And that's where you can start to dynamically. The other part about it is, depending upon which SDK of ours you're using, the the content that was built in Torch actually gets translated into modifiable content at runtime in whatever platform you're using. So like, just to keep it simple, let's say the Torch uh, SDK is embedded in the ServiceNow Android and iOS app. Right, that's um, exactly the use case I'm thinking of. Yeah, yes. and so in that case, what we're doing is we're allowing you to take the Torch built interactive content, the interface, mm -hmm. and load it into on iOS scene kit and on Android, it would be scene form. Okay. And you could then drill into the content. Think of it like a DOM where like mm -hmm. on a web page or, you know, a web interface where you can like traverse the DOM and dynamically change elements. That's what the SDK gets you. Okay. And that's where, so, so it, it's like, think it's almost back in the days of like the, the visual basic, you've got your interface builder and you kind sure. of wire it up type of type of. Approach. Right. And so, so we would, you know, build the interface bring it into our app and then we need to to hook it up to 
to our events to, yeah. to, to send, you know, to, to modify those, the, the data elements of that visualization. So yeah. in that scenario, actually, so th there is actually an entirely new job that has just been created here, right? Because we've got the developer, like Andrew is a developer who developed the API. And then we've got your company has developed all the APIs. And now somewhere in there, you have a scene developer. Yep. That, that does not, it's a job that does not previously exist, but now somebody is developing the interaction that wires all those things together and when the models and et cetera. Yeah. It's kind of like the user experience designer for, for spatial interface, you know, spatial content and yeah, the, the 3d part, the, the part that we handle for you, cause like, you know, a more technical savvy person might say, well, then why don't I just write to scene kit and scene mm -hmm. form directly? What do I need torch for? Well, if you recall when we built this project on the fly, I just pulled in 2D and 3D assets into the scene quickly. And we're doing a lot of stuff on the cloud side to make that happen. Mm -hmm. If you were working directly in scene kit code, you'd, be, you'd have to be like, well, what model 3D model formats do they take? How do I position a 3D model relative to that you know, server rack locator code? Mm -hmm by just typing in coordinates in a, in a, you know, in a coding environment. So what that's the part we, that's the part we specialize in is the ability for you to pull in these assets and, and very quickly, you know, visualize them and see them as opposed right. to the old way, which would be, let me type in some coordinates, run it on the phone, take a look. Oh, it's a little, you know, I, if I yeah, see it's it a, at all, it's a visual me. interface builder. <laughs> yeah. To put yeah. it, to, to put it in service now terms, the torch API is like a uh, flow designer, right? It, it, it's not that it gives you net new stuff, it's that it gives you a drag and drop and very simple way to uh, enable functionality with all the heavy lifting done elsewhere. Where all the exactly. really, uh, all the really low level stuff, you know, you're, you're kind of moving up the stack. And I'm just, yep. dis I'm describing at a high level what I want to happen and I'm not worried about how to cast the shadow and you know, all this kind of stuff. Yep, that's right. Okay, so cool. So people can get your app. Uh, from yep. their respective app stores, the Torch AR I, app. Right. And then you said iOS we, only. Yeah. Oh, and iOS you, only. Okay. You said, is Android on the roadmap? That's a question we've got in the chat. chat. Yeah, I get that question every day. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we would love to get Android out there. Um, what what we're focusing on right now is it's going to take a lot of work to get the design environment running on enough different Android devices to be useful mm -hmm. for people. So yeah. what we're doing is we're focusing on getting to Android on the publish and SDK side first. Mm -hmm. um, but it, Android is certainly on our radar. We get, we literally have thousands <laughs> of people signed up for early access for it. And, uh, and I wished I could give it to people today. And, and where do we get more information about uh, details and, and examples and, you know, uh, after they yep. get the app, what do they do next? To... Yeah, I would I would say just go to torch.app first, and um, we have the the download link for the app there. We've got an overview of our platform. Uh, just this week, if somebody's more on the coding side, we launched torch.dev, which talks about uh, our our SDK and how that works. Mm -hmm. um, but we have tons and tons of blog posts, tons and tons of YouTube channels. We know this is a very new world for a lot of people. And we're doing a lot of work to educate and help people. We also have a public Slack called Torch Friends, where we love it when people jump in and say, I'm trying to figure out how to do this thing. And the whole team jumps in. And, you know, just like on this live stream today, it sounds like we had a few Torch people just listening. <laughs> play that. We really, we, we know how, we know, we know how excited people are about this stuff, but we also know how there's a mental, you know, there's a different mentality about thinking about 3D and building applications mm -hmm. in 3D. And so we spend a lot of our time educating. So uh, we do too. Download that, we've, but... we've, we've got our, you know, our developer.servicenow.com site and uh, all of our channels, uh, as well as our, our Slack channel that we interact with. And that's where a lot of our, our, our contributors uh, come and, and uh, uh, share with us here. Uh, so that's, it was that's it was exactly cool. perfect because it was a suggestion from the cat to the chat that got the thing working, which is yes. a, a key portion of the dynamic of the show. Yep. <laughs> All that's, right, we got that's one the great uh, part of the live live show, and uh, and Dave's going to tell us uh, how to actually, how to wrap up here. Before we do that, we have one unaddressed question. Garrison asks, uh, "Can we develop content for glasses like Hololens?" Yes. 
So, so um, I, I mentioned it really early in the broadcast, but um, everything that you learn from working with Torch on a tablet or a phone um, almost directly uh, translates to wearables. Um, uh, uh, something we announced as a part of our SDK and our published product is we're gonna give you multiple ways to get your content running on wearables. Um, that was mine and my co-founder's background for many years. We started on the wearable side um, and actually that's why all the interaction triggers are limited to select gaze and proximity uh, because those are things that we know in the future will translate to wearable devices. Right. So we're very much, uh, we, this is not a dead end into just smartphone type experiences. This is a stepping mm -hmm. stone and a starting point to get you ready for wearables. Um, there's not a HoloLens workflow uh, today, um, but if some, you know, it's something we're working on. If somebody needs it sooner than later, please reach out and we can talk about that. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. And yeah, uh, again, torch.app. Uh, if you want to go look at that, developer.servicenow.com. If you want to look at our stuff, hopefully we've got a little two-way cross-pollination. Now let's go around the horn and rate our beers. So you get to go first, Paul. You get to go first as the guest. Uh, and so this is, uh, uh, you know, um, if, if you're familiar with the, the app, um, the untapped, uh, untapped. Oh, yeah. We we use the untapped rating scale, so it's a zero to five with a quarter point jumps. Well, as a at very active untapped user, <laughs> I will go, I will I will go ahead and tell you my untapped score for this beer. <laughs> You're actually this is actually empirical. He's pulling it up. Yeah, we have talked yeah. about what's. I couldn't. I actually couldn't see that. So I, I'm. I have. I have given my my wife might get mad at this. I've given White Tie by Westbrook out of Charleston, South Carolina, a four out of five stars. Fantastic, fantastic, right. Andrew. All right, my uh, Pig Pounder Breweries, the Tripping Pigs, because uh, that's just a great name. Um, is is an IPA, and I'm not the the biggest fan of IPAs, but this this is a good one. And we had a high note uh, that always gets it a, a quarter point. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's a three seven five. It's a, it's a good solid happy beer for me. And this thing, which my chroma key is getting, but I don't even know the name of this thing. I can't tell if it's Balu or what it is. I'll have to <laughs> look this. I'm probably going to have to bing this thing to figure out what the heck beer I'm drinking. I'm going to give this thing a four. I actually like it. It's a coffee and vanilla oh, wow. stout. Nice. Um, I was actually going to go for something a little summerier, um, but once I got it thawed up enough to open, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks, everybody. Uh, I actually expect that this will be uh, – I think I expect that we'll get a lot of uptake on this video because it's so different from what we normally do. And it's actually, super, and it was super really cool. fun and yeah. I'm definitely going to waste some time doing, <laughs> doing some stuff with build this. A, uh, my recommendations are build a scavenger hunt in your house and okay. give it, you know, hand your iPad or your, your device to, to someone else. To someone say, else I've, yeah. I've made a little treasure map in the house. Uh, or go out in cool. the, go out in the backyard and plan your backyard. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, again, thank you, Paul from uh, Paul you. Reynolds from Torch, and uh, thank you, for Andrew and myself. Thank you, and enjoy the holiday weekend.